This talk is about a survey which we carried out on Port Meadow near Oxford. It was for the Wilbercote First World War Memorial Project and they had become established to create a memorial to the airmen who were killed on this airfield during the First World War. Our survey was the final part of their project because they first built a memorial, then had a information board and the geophysics was the third part to see whether there were any remains existing. You can see that there were numerous other people involved with this project, so fortunately we did not need to do very much background research. Just so that people can get their bearings, uh, there's Oxford and there's the centre of Oxford, that's the railway line going northwards, the River Thames, and this is Port Meadow, and the area which we're concerned with is this northern end of Port Meadow. Here's more detail of the meadow. It's a generally flattish area with some ditches in it, there's one and another. There's a bridge over the ditch just there concrete building in it just there, um, prehistoric round barrows are known just there uh, and there is some Iron Age remains in that vicinity. Uh, that's the Thames on, on the west and that's the site of Godstow Nunnery. The car park at the northern end there and the bridge next door to it. The LIDAR picture shows the height of the land here. Uh, to the west we have the A34 um, and there's the Thames. This is the area with which we're concerned. There's the bridge that I referred to earlier. There's the car park. Uh, we will also see this curved ditch later on um, and there's a feature just down there which is the uh, one of the Iron Age or Bronze Age uh, circles. As part of our researches we looked at old maps of the area but this is the only one which we found had anything of any interest. It was published in 1920 but was based on a survey carried out in 1919. And here you can see that it has a shed and a track and a shooting range. Um, on their own, these wouldn't have been any uh, great excitement, but um, it's good to know that there was a record of them. Walking over the area, various things can be seen. There is the surfacing of the track, a hole which has been made by animals as a salt lick, but it, it has pieces of, of ash in the uh, section. A concrete building, a hole which presumably has a stopcock at the bottom, and an iron ring. Um, again, on their own, these wouldn't make much, much sense uh, because at least the iron ring and the concrete building could have been attributed to the use of the area during the Second World War when there were anti-glider defences erected there. Fortunately other people had done a lot of the research on this site. Peter Smith had done a work and had written a book about it. The Victoria County History mentioned the aerodrome in a, two, a couple of lines in their volume for the area. The Shuttleworth collection have a lot of photographs and have been kind enough to allow us to use them. The Historic England Record Centre in Swindon uh, has approximately 69 photographs of Port Meadow, but we don't know which ones are relevant to our period of study uh, because we cannot get there to see the um, collection because of the uh, virus problems in 2020 and 2021. 
the airmen were trained how to take photographs whilst they were at Port Meadow. So there are probably quite a lot around. This one is a good one. It shows the track going down to a yard. In front of the yard there is a, a large building and then there are several square structures. These square ones are Bessonneau type hangers which are a um, canvas cover over a timber frame. Then we have a track going to, in between various lines of huts. We have bell tents and a possible pile of dirt there or something's happened. I'm not quite sure what yet. And in, in front of, of the uh, hangars we have the airplanes lined up, presumably retained by ropes, um, which is why that iron ring is in the ground. Here is another air photograph. This time we have gained another hangar, a rifle range uh, that was initially used to, for airplane machine guns but later on was, was used for, for rifle practice and a possible vegetable patch. This picture shows the airfield in use with an aircraft which has taken off and may be making its way to the uh, target area which is where the concrete building was or still is. Um, the people sheltered in the concrete building when the targets were being attacked um, either with flower bombs or with um, machine guns. Um, you can see the hangars here, essentially very large tents and that's the main um, rigging shed as it's known. This picture is not as good quality as the others and it must have been taken towards the end of the First World War by which time things had expanded even further. We have gained another hangar there and, we, and two more just there quite close to the river. The small bell tents have gone and been replaced with larger tents. Having seen the quality of the air photographs and other photographs of the buildings, we questioned the Memorial Trust as to whether they really thought that geophysics could tell them anything that they didn't know already. They were adamant that they wished a survey to be carried out because there is a difference between an area where there had been something but was now nothing and the same area where there were still remains even though they could not be seen. Bearing this in mind, we agreed with them that we would do a day's sample survey just to test whether the geophysics would show up anything at all. We used magnetometry and earth resistance. Magnetometry there uh, detects things by looking for variations in the earth's magnetic field uh, caused by remains and earth resistance looks for dif differences in the dampness of soil. At the end I'll um, give you a reference to a free book which can describe these things in more detail. This is the result of our trial survey. These are 30 meter grids and the top right one here is uh, the earth resistance survey and the rest is magnetometry. You can see that we got the outline of one of the hangars of the yard. These must be pads for the corrugated iron building and this is the area of the sheds. To enable us to extend the survey we put a grid over the air photograph. This grid is aligned on the Ordnance Survey National Grid, which should make relocating any finds quite easy. Whilst we thought that we could just 
carry on working and extend every day. The animals on the meadow had different ideas. The horses and cattle used to like getting tangled up in our strings and so we had to work around them by waiting until they had left an area before we could survey it. This is the overall picture. Uh, we will see the various sections in more detail later, uh, except this diagonal that was put in just to see if there had been any low parts which had been filled uh, to make the area level, but we, we couldn't find any. You will see that the central area has far higher readings than the outer edges do, and the prehistoric stuff in the southwest is fairly faint. I think this is because that they must have put fly ash and clinker and cinders down when they laid out the original track and yard and probably under some of the other sites for buildings and in the ramps that were put into the uh, individual hangars. So these all show quite well because the ash is more magnetic than the soil in, in the rest of the area and the areas between some of the hangars may have become muddy paths and so there was probably a pile of ash somewhere that people could have just dumped to make up the um, the, the ground to, to, to fill the puddles in. So that is why I think that we have detected these otherwise ephemeral remains on the basis of the coal ash that was uh, prevalent in the area. This is the central area which I'm showing three times to show the effect of different levels of processing of the data. You can see the different processing levels here. Now this processing level is often used to detect prehistoric remains but here because of the uh, presence of, of the um, coal ash it is obscuring some remains such as that square set of presumably bricks there gets lost in the, amongst the high readings with that processing level. So that the middle processing level is probably better for this area, although this left hand one does show the pieces of iron which were thrown around or left in the ground around this hangar and which define it as the other processing levels uh, tend to make a bit of a mess of it really. So one should always make sure that the processing level that's done is appropriate for the things that you're trying to find and I tend to use at least two processing levels for most areas so that people can see the range of remains. Um, here we have the um, main flight shed, the, the, that corrugated iron building that may have had a floor in it and these are the ramps going into the individual hangars. This is the central area uh, with two clipping levels and this time north at the top. Um, track coming down, yard area, flight shed, hangar, various ramps. I suspect that is where the contents of the earth closets may have ended up. But one thing we can't find is any evidence of the tents. It's quite good to see that our preconceived notions that we shouldn't be able to find anything uh, did turn out to be true in some cases. So the tents that we do find are those associated with the initial construction phase of the site rather than its later use. Here's the eastern area where you can see that the remains are becoming less distinct. We still have ash in between the various hangars and in the ramps to them. 
I don't know what that circular thing is. It's in the gap, or the centre of it is in the gap between hangers. I, I suspect it might be to do with a bonfire when the, the um, hangers were dismantled, or it may be nothing to do with the airfield at all. This is the western part of the area. There appears to be no trace whatsoever of the two hangars that, which were erected here at the end of the First World War. Although we have got other features which include this thing which I suspect is a soakaway which drained the main yard area. And this is the path in between the rows of huts. These things are pieces of iron and we have a low magnetic anomaly which curves around here, which we'll see more of later. This is the southern area where we were looking for the firing range, which is just there. There are brick anomalies. There must have been bricks under the bottom of the um, timber sheds. 35 5 meter range which shows that people in the first world war be, were being trained for fairly short range warfare in the air otherwise the prehistoric stuff that's possibly bronze age as is that one um, that is usually reckoned to be uh, iron age or romano british probably Iron Age hut circles, some of which are really quite small and some of which have been recut several times. A trackway going through, which has got more magnetic material in one ditch than the other. This is the low magnetic anomaly that we've seen before going through, not the straightest of ditches. And we have a right angular or not right angle L-shaped ditch here. Um, not sure what these are. Um, that angle isn't 90 degrees. Uh, one day somebody will hopefully research these because they may well find that that direction is the midsummer sunset and that the midwinter sunset it saves the effort of going to Stonehenge. So what next? Ideally not much because the remains have been protected by not being ploughed for about the last thousand years and hopefully this will continue. The area could make quite a good geophysics test site as it has a car park, toilets and various pubs. The problem with that is that as is a scheduled ancient monument a section 42 license would be required every time that it was used and the rigmarole involved in obtaining and complying with those is possibly more trouble than it's worth. One of the main aims of the memorial committee was to publicise the remains on Port Meadow. We have put our report onto the Archaeology Data Services Grey Lit Literature Library. Uh, it's been there for a couple of months now and hopefully it will be available to the public soon. We have also put it on our book, which is a rolling consultation um, entitled Archaeology in the Service of Property Development, which is available on the Google Play Store and various other places on the internet. An article also appeared in Current Archaeology in January, February 2021, which summarised the results here. Thank you.